Good evening, everyone, and thank you all very much for attending tonight's Research Tuesdays event, Finding a Future for Food Crops. My name's Kalia Primer, and I'm a current PhD student here at the University of Adelaide, and I'm also your MC for tonight. I would like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, who are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North, North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. So in tonight's presentation, we turn our attention to genetically modified food crops and their future on Earth. Gene editing has revolutionized plant research to such an extent that it may eventually bypass the need for GM crops. Even better, the synergy offered by a toolkit of GM, gene editing and traditional breeding might offer society a real chance to address future challenges in global food production. Tonight you're going to hear about the innovative research that's paving the way for the next generation of food crops and beyond this world even. Our presenter, Associate Professor Matthew Tucker, will address the evolution of GM food crops, what they offer and why they can be controversial. Matthew will discuss his research and share how it could help us improve food production in the face of a changing climate and shifting nutritional demands. Following Matthew's presentation, I will open up the Q&A session as we usually do to our uh, both in-person and online audiences. For those of you who are online, we encourage you to submit your questions uh, during the presentation via the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. But now a little bit more about Associate Professor Matthew Tucker. He is a trained biotechnologist and has worked with GM plants for over 20 years. He's the Deputy Director of the Weight Research Institute and the Chair of the University of Adelaide Institutional uh, Biosafety Committee. His research investigates how plants are genetically programmed to produce different cells and tissues with the aim of understanding how these pathways can be engineered to optimise yield and use. Please join me in welcoming Matthew. Thanks very much, Kalia, for the very uh, generous introduction and thank you all for attending. It's fantastic to be here actually seeing people uh, in person rather than on the screen, although thank you everyone for joining online as well. So um, look, I thought I'd, I'd open up with a, a bit of a uh, discussion about agriculture and food. And I think I need to take you on a journey tonight, um, particularly in terms of where GM and genetic modification is, um, why we need GM and, and why it's actually part of a package of innovation for agriculture and food and then actually think about how we regulate GM. So it's a very important part of our, our program and our, our uh, work that we do on GM, but also if we're ever gonna have GM, genetically modified crops in the field, we need to consider a bit the, the regulations. And then finally, I'll move on to gene editing, which some of you may have heard of before. It's a very interesting topic. It's, it's an advance compared to what we know previously in terms of GM, and it's something that may really become uh, the way of the future as we move forward. And what is the future? Well, I think we've definitely got a future in Australia and on Earth, but some of the research that we're doing at the weight is uh, suggesting that we might be able to take this off planet uh, to future, um, for future generations. So what's my background and, and why agriculture and food? And I have to be honest and say, when I was an undergraduate, and I'm from, I'm from South Australia, I never thought that I'd be working in agriculture and food. And actually as a topic, I thought, man, this is so boring. It really was not what I wanted to do. It was all about medical research and pharmaceutical biology and the like. But my parents who were, were quite uh, normal people, one was a teacher, one was a, um, a, a, a worked in a bank, and one was born in Kingscote, one grew up in Narracourt, very soul of the earth people, used to take me on holidays every year to the York Peninsula, and I'm sure many of you have been there. And these are just a couple of photos of what I remember of being sort of imprinted in my memory of what I saw in the York Peninsula. And, and probably for those of you who are online, you can see me hopefully moving my, my pointer now. Um, is this sort of recognition of, of fishing, okay? I love fishing, and I go fishing, and I still go fishing now, but. You know, all the jetties and all the places I used to go, there used to be these silos there. And those silos always had trucks coming to them and there used to be chaff and all sorts of stuff flying around. And then what really used to annoy me was these big boats would come in and then I wouldn't be allowed on the jetty. And of course, these boats are taking grain, wheat and barley from the York Peninsula all around the world. And slowly but surely it dawned on me, okay, so we're actually producing grain here. This is, this is what it's about. I go on holidays here, I love it every year, it's part of my memory, but actually we're, we're a producer of agricultural commodities. 
And when I now look at that and see how much that's worth, the South Australia in particular, a couple of years ago, this was estimated to be worth about $7 billion. So it's a, it's a pretty significant industry. And a lot of the land that we see around in South Australia is actually used for agricultural production, whether that's going to be for crops, whether it's going to be for horticulture, whether it's going to be for grazing animals. Um, but really, when we look at the type of exports and their value that we get in South Australia, the majority of them are really um, are crops which are food crops. And I've, for some reason, I've missed wheat at the top here, but wheat, barley, wine grapes, potatoes, pulses, oranges and almonds, they're all really valuable crops and a really important part of South Australia. And I think many of you may have seen in the advertiser and perhaps online and, and some of the news reports that this year is an example of a bumper year. We're looking at a, a crop which is going to be worth around about 2.8 billion. That's just in terms of grain crops and production. And this is an amazing outcome of a good season. So this is a particularly important part of South Australia and also an important part of Australia. Now in terms of Australia, 70% of our products are exported massive amount of production here which is going overseas. So there's never going to be a problem with Australia producing enough food. Um, people may debate that, but it's really, a, it's really clear that the value that we get of our, out of our land is mainly through producing these agricultural products. And this is a bit of a convoluted graph here from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, but what it shows over a period of time is the value of our agricultural commodities. And it's sort of ranging up to around about 50 to $60 billion on an annual basis. But what you can also see, these blue, this blue shading here, that's Asia. So that's uh, receiving most of our exports, and that is steadily increasing. Of course, we've faced some challenges with China, but at the same time, we're still finding markets in Asia for a lot of our food and, and, and grain. So this is a particularly important part of our um, economy in terms of where our produce goes. And Asian demand is expected to increase by up to 50%, uh, somewhere between, well, 2021 and 2050 are the projections. So this is a really important destination. And the reason that we're chosen is for that is for geographical proximity, but also in terms of the fact that we produce high value, high quality agricultural uh, products and food. So what limits our production? What stops us from actually delivering more and actually getting more value? Um, and it really relates to a lot of the, the, the topics which are of central importance, not just in South Australia, but across Australia and the globe. So this is a changing climate, something that we're facing uh, on an annual basis in terms of seeing fluctuations in the conditions. Water availability, very topical um, in Australia at the moment. Soil health in terms of how good our soil is at actually recovering from putting in crops and then getting crops through in sort of a rotation cycle. The constant challenges with weeds and pests and disease, not only those which are being introduced from uh, overseas, but also those which are evolving as we go through um, uh, years of rotations of crops, and then changes in land use. So are we actually using our agricultural land for agriculture, or is it being um, used for other purposes, such as building houses, for example? So if I just touch on weeds and pests, uh, as part of this, this costs the Australian economy about $12 billion a year. So that's not in losses, that's in terms of what we have to spray, what we have to treat to make sure that we're actually producing a, a viable, high yielding crop. So this is a particularly significant change when you think about, well, we're, we're producing, we're exporting 70%, what, is, what are we losing in terms of that $12 billion? And this is an important topic that's been uh, addressed in a number of, I guess you'll call them blue papers or roadmaps. How do we move forward with agriculture? And we've seen this over the past two or three years on a national level, but also on a state level. So the National Farmers Federation says by 2030, we, we plan to have um, a value of $100 billion in farm gate output. Now that's going from 60 billion now to 100 billion. So that's a fairly significant change. It's actually going to be very hard to achieve that simply just by increasing yield. So we've got to come up with some other way to add value to our crops so that we're actually getting more for them, uh, while the amount of land that we're using is, is probably decreasing. The state government has a, a say, growth state agenda, which they um, think that we should be able to hit about 23 billion by 2030. So I think that's part of the 100 billion in the national uh, roadmap. And currently, well, about 2018-19, we're sitting at about 15.2 billion. So we need to increase our production by 3% a year. And that's not easy either. 
what we're seeing in current crops in terms of increasing yield is you know, ranging between somewhere between 1.5 to 2% if we're lucky. So we're certainly not meeting that demand in terms of producing more. Uh, and then the same thing goes for the SA grains industry in terms of their blueprint. They think we should be hitting about a $6 billion industry by 2030. Obviously, you can see that uh, from what I said before, it's about a $2.8 billion industry. So there's a lot of work still to be done there. So how do we increase agricultural production? And, and this is the type of slide that we'll use in our, our lectures for undergraduates. And we try to teach them that production is not just about the plants that we're growing. Of course, it's a, it's a package. It's about the genetics, obviously, but it's also about the environment in which our plants grow in. And, you know, we're very lucky in South Australia, if I talk about the York Peninsula, for example, to have really good soils and rainfall, which allows us to produce that high quality wheat and barley. The same in the Mid-North Air Peninsula. So the environment's really important, but the environment changes and is changing. So we need to understand how our plants grow in different environments and we need to manage them. So we have the management component, which is when do we add fertiliser? How much fertiliser do we add? How do we control our pests? How do we add growth regulators to make sure they grow at the right time, they flower at the right time, they resist things like frost at the right time? So these all have to come together to give us the final package, which is yield. And the genetics is the part that I'm interested in. I've been interested in it for a number of years, ever since I got over that hurdle of not really liking plants very much. Eventually, I joined CSIRO uh, as an honours student and uh, started to work on seed development there. And that progressed through to a PhD and, and then overseas experience. And all that time I've focused mainly on the genetics. It's now that I really have a much more um, uh, broader role that I really start to see the, the importance of environment and managing this. But what I'm going to be talking about mainly tonight is genetics. And we've been using genetics for a long time. So genetic engineering, I'll call it, is not new. And what I'm showing here is an image of a, a field. This is in Scotland through, with one of our collaborators at the James Hutton Institute looking at a field of different barley varieties. And I think you can clearly see there's a lot of diversity there. And that diversity is what we actually use as breeders to find varieties which are better performing than others. And they may be good at one thing. They may give us a really high yield. They may give us uh, tolerance against pests. They may give us tolerance against droughts or salt, various things. And we can find diversity in that, that field, but we can't find everything. The important thing is that what has happened over time through genetic engineering, this is selection of traits from what we might consider the original wild variety all the way through to a domesticated variety, is we've selected for the things that we need. And this image here is showing corn. It's a fantastic image, I love it. This is what we, we started off with back at Tiacinte, and this is what we ended up with today in modern corn that we eat. And you can see there's quite some differences that have happened over time through selection. But, you know, what we've lost along the way is what always puzzles plant scientists. What was so special about Tiacinte that allowed it to grow? What were Tiacinte varieties doing? Were they growing on really tough, uh, in tough environments and conditions? And perhaps, you know, we've, we've lost some of our variation that we might benefit from in modern day corn, even though it grows very well. And that's not restricted to corn. That's almost all of our food crops. And you can see another classic example here in terms of tomato. So tomato domestication, there's a number of uh, wild tomatoes, some which do look sort of like our, our current one in terms of at least the fruit turn red, others stay green. But you know, a process of domestication in terms of selecting new varieties, crossing uh, uh, varieties together to give us what we consider to be our, our modern day tomato has led to some very uh, excellent outputs in terms of yield and size, but we've, we've lost a lot of diversity along the way. So where does genetic diversity comes from, come from? And it comes from the cell and it comes from the DNA in the cell. So almost all the diversity that we see apart from the response to how plants grow in their environment is due to differences in the DNA. And we can see that DNA is packaged into individual cells here. Uh, for example, barley has seven chromosomes. These chromosomes each contain a large number of genes and this is the DNA code. So differences in that DNA code are what leads to that diversity and those differences can arise in many ways. They can arise from UV irradiation, simply growing in the sun. We have the same thing. You can get that from x-rays. You can get it from different chemicals such as smoke. Smoke can induce mutations in, in cells. Um, and sometimes the plant machinery in terms of replication makes a mistake. 
So that's the way that you can end up with mutations, that's the way that you end up with diversity, and that's how we end up with the plants that we eat today being selected for and being um, high yielding and nutritious and all the good things that we like about eating um, food crops. Okay, but things have changed over a number of years and this is about a 20 year cycle here because now we have DNA sequence from almost all of our major uh, food crops. And this ranges from model species, certainly not a food crop, but the first plant to be sequenced, which was Arabidopsis thaliana. It's, it's essentially the, the lab rat of the plant world through to the tomato genome, all the way through to only a couple of years ago, a full genome sequence being available for wheat. So once we have that genome sequence, that means we know what the DNA sequence is, which means we know how many genes approximately there are in that genome. And that means we can understand why genes might be different between different varieties and how we might be able to use that difference to understand why plants perform better, why they are higher yielding, why they might have a better nutritional profile. And this is where science comes in because we can make use of this variation. Once we understand a gene that controls a particular process, we can start to modify that gene via gene technology. And this is where genetically modified organisms appeared. And this happened 30 years ago. This is when it first started. And this is an example of what actually happens when we, we transform wheat. And this is, these are photographs which have been kindly provided by staff at the weight. So for example, we can pop out little embryos from a wheat developing seed that uh, we can see a group of those embryos there. And the way that we engineer those embryos is to take a gene of interest and we put that gene of interest, for example, it could be a gene that conveys salt tolerance in a particular species. We put that into a bacteria called Agrobacterium. This is a bacteria that normally infects plants. It's developed its, its, um, its life cycle around infecting plant roots, uh, inserting its own DNA into those plant roots, tricking those roots into making hormones that allow it to then effectively grow and propagate. So what we do is we, we remove those genes that are tricking the plant into making the, the hormones, insert our gene of interest, we incubate it with the plant cells, they get infected, we can use this amazing ability of plant cells to grow, on different, different hormones and what you can do is you can get this callus to make roots and shoots and eventually we get plants that come back and those plants contain the gene of interest and are genetically modified. Very simple way of explaining it but it's essentially how it works. Okay but once we make this GM crop, whether it's a food crop like wheat or whether it's uh, a, a, another type of crop, it's regulated in Australia. And this is by the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator. It's a regulatory, federal reg regulatory body. And they make sure that anyone who's working on gene technology has to have approval to work on gene technology. So for example, the University of Adelaide, um, we, we do a lot of work in gene technology. We must have an institutional biosafety committee that assesses all of our work to make sure, yep, it's gene technology, it's covered, and it, we can get permission to work on it. So that's fine. There's a, there's a regulatory blueprint it also means that we can't just produce this crop and go and put it out in the field and say, fine, I've got a new crop, it's highly nutritious, it's gonna produce a really wonderful product and you can have it. That's, that's not how it works. Once we get approval to do that, we, we need to go through um, a number of years of, of uh, research in order to get to the point where we can actually have a product to be released. So some of the earliest products that were regulated by the, or at least the OGTR is one of which was effectively designed in Australia, which is the Blue Carnation, and this came from a company called Floragene many, many years ago now. Still in operation, effectively it was sold off to some, some other partners in Japan and, and the US. But what they did is they took a gene from Pansy and put it into Petunia to create this, this beautiful blue, blue Petunia, which is actually quite a significant uh, market in countries like Japan, where it's about a $6 billion market for cut flowers. So that was, that was done in Australia. Overseas at about the same time, uh, we started to see uh, little food crops being edited, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, genetically modified. And one of the first products to appear was the Flavor Saver Tomato. This was a tomato that was engineered to increase its shelf life. It improved storage. It, it didn't get damaged during transport. And it ended up in, in things like tomato puree. It was a massive saving in terms of production costs. So it was actually quite effective. But this is where the issue started in terms of uh, genetic modification and then the public probably turning against this. So in terms of that particular product, it fell by the wayside, even though it was one of the first ones to be 
uh, produced. So I'm going to ask this question, and I apologise to those who are online who might not be able to answer it, but for those people who are in the room, I wonder if you might raise your hand to let me know if you think you've eaten GM food before. So we're sitting at about 50%, probably even slightly less than 50%. Well, the answer hopefully doesn't shock you too much, but it's almost all of us have eaten GM food. At least we've eaten a product which has come from a GM plant. Now, the typical examples of that are soy, cottonseed oil, corn, and sugar beet. So they can be anything from breakfast cereals, mayonnaises, salad dressings, cooking oils, the sugar we use, and pretty much the majority of that that gets imported is GM. Now, that's, that's interesting, but is that a problem? Should, be, should we be worried about it? Well, fortunately, there's another body in Australia called the um, FASANS, or the Food Standards Australia New Zealand, which has actually done some pretty stringent checks on those products to make sure there's no difference to them in them compared to what we would get if we were using non-GM soy or cottonseed oil or corn. And there's a number of food crops which have been approved for consumption uh, and, and use in Australia ranging from uh, canola, which is obviously a, a very topical crop at the moment, through to potato, rice, and in brackets here, wheat. So wheat is currently undergoing uh, some very interesting checks to see whether a particular type of wheat might actually be, uh, a GM wheat, might be released for human consumption. And I'll touch on that shortly. Okay, so there is a, a standard that we must follow. Uh, once again, if you're going to have a GM crop, you have to go through OGTR. If you're going to make a product, it has to go through uh, for SANS in order to get approval. It's a fairly strict protocol in order to make that work. So it's been through some fairly stringent safety checks. What might horrify some of you, but I, I have to say, is actually probably one in 20 plants, if we consider the definition of gene technology as having been infected by agrobacteria and then genes inserted into the genome, approximately one in 20 flowering plants have had that happen to them naturally. And the, the, the best example is, is sweet potato, uh, where in about 2015, a publication showed that some of those genes which are normally transferred from uh, agrobacterium into the plant are, are still present in, in, in domesticated uh, sweet potato that we use. So that, that definition of gene technology starts to get a little bit unclear. Perhaps that's not the best way to decide whether we've got a GM product or not. And some comments were made about this, you know, this, this plant contains a GM event and consequently it's been eaten for centuries by millions of people. And then a more broader study which was looking at the sequence of, of genomes in flowering plants found that approximately uh, one in 20 actually contained evidence of having that transformation event and that includes bananas, it includes cranberries, it includes peanuts. So if, if we take that at face value, then yes, we've been eating genetically modified crops for a long time, but that's based on a definition. So we need to be careful about how we interpret it. So then that brings back the question, do we really need to engineer food crops in the lab? Why are we engineering food crops in the first place and is there really any benefit? And the, the topics that they are being addressed by research in this area, so particularly genetic modification, mainly involve these topics. So sustainable crop production, nutrient-enriched foods, sources of biomolecules, environmental management, and new crops for new environments. And I'm just going to give some examples of, of those and how they've, I guess, evolved with time. And some of the ones that you might be most familiar with are things like herbicide-tolerant plants, and soybean is the classic case here. So this image here is showing a, a, a GM soybean, uh, and you can see the rows of this soybean here. In this particular side of the field, it's been sprayed with glyphosate, which has killed off all the weeds, and that, um, that soybean is completely resistant to that herbicide. This side has not been sprayed with that herbicide, and you can see the weeds which are getting in between, and are certainly going to deprive that crop of, of nitrogen. They're going to stop and impact its yield. So, this was a, a major um, evolution in agriculture. It's been used not only in soybean, it's also been used in corn and in Australia, in canola. And as many of you probably know, over the last 12 months, we've got canola, we've got GM canola growing in the field now. There's a number of sites around South Australia which are testing it out to see whether it's really a useful part of our rotation system. The anecdotal evidence we get from states like Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia, which have been growing it for years, is it actually leads to a reduction in herbicide use. So farmers that are having weed problems will use it. They'll spray their crop 
they don't have a problem with weeds for about five seasons subsequent to that. So it's not just impacting their canola crop that they're growing, it's impacting their wheat or their barley or their lentils or whatever crop that is coming after them, giving them a better production value and a better production system. Another example, which is not a food crop, but it does lead to sometimes the production of cottonseed oil, and this is GM, uh, GM cotton. This is a photograph from Narrabri up in New South Wales. So this is an insect tolerant GM cotton. You can see that it's certainly producing a lot of cotton. This is a non-GM cotton, which is susceptible to the insects, completely deprived of any cotton production. So whether it's right that we produce cotton in Australia or not, given our limited water, is another question perhaps for another day. But in terms of actually a sustainable system of producing it, the GM cotton revolutionised uh, the cotton industry in Australia and effectively saved it from collapse. What we're seeing around the world is, is more food crops which are starting to appear which are GM. And this is a, an, an example of a potato. It's called the innate potato. It's a little bit... Um, probably less controversial in that it's taken genes from wild potatoes that might convey tolerance to things like blight, cold storage or acrylamide levels and introduced them into elite varieties that perform relatively well in the field but they're susceptible to those conditions. And this photograph here is showing some of the, the field grown material. The ones that are growing are the ones, they're the elite potatoes, um, they're the innate potatoes, I beg your pardon. The ones that have died are the ones that are not actually containing that GM event. Um, so particularly given the, the experience the world has had in terms of potato famine, this may have been something that would have been very useful uh, in Ireland a number of years ago. So we've talked about food crops, we've talked about management. Now I'm going to talk about plants being factories. And this is becoming more relevant given the challenge we're facing with, with things like COVID vaccines. Um, the first example I'll mention is the, the super high oleic acid safflower. So this is a, a crop which is, is approved for use in Australia. It's an oil crop and what they're using the, uh, the, the seed oil to do is to extract a high um, oleic acid oil. This can be used as a substitute for petroleum in things like the manufacture of plastics and lubricants and cosmetics. So that's an interesting one. It's a little bit similar to canola in terms of canola being an oil crop, but this one is actually targeted directly towards reducing our use of um, oil, which is being pulled out of the ground. Um, that is entering, I think we do have trials of that in South Australia this year. Um, the other one is, is probably a little bit more relevant. As I said, this is about growing plants, actually there's vaccine factories. And there's a lot of research we started to look at that over the past two years. Can we actually use plants as a cheaper, more efficient way to produce vaccines? Now, in the case of tobacco, it may be just producing parts of the protein that we can use to uh, elicit an immune response in, in injections. But other scientists have started to look at, for example, eating the food as a way to direct the vaccine into our systems. And this is something that's been considered for a long time. It started off with bananas and has progressed all the way through to um, a case now whereby it's the preliminary evidence at least suggests that the GM tomato can be used as a substitute for that injection for COVID vaccination. And what I'll touch on effectively last is biofortification. Now this is probably the, the, the most attractive topic for a GMO research and when we're talking about this to, to graduate students. Uh, it's also a classic example of how things can perhaps go wrong due to regulation and, um, and bodies opposing it just simply based on the fact it's genetically modified. So um, golden rice was developed as an, a solution or possible solution, part of a solution for vitamin A deficiency. And vitamin A deficiency leads to blindness in around about 500,000 children every year. Most of it is terminal, leading to death. Uh, mainly in, in Asian countries and African countries. And this rice was developed um, actually at the University of Freiburg by Peter Bayer. And what it does is it takes a daffodil gene and a bacterial gene, puts it into rice. That's sufficient to switch on beta carotene, um, which can be uh, used to treat the body effectively and, and provide vitamin A. Um, the same thing has been done recently in, in banana. So this is the super banana. It's enriched in beta carotene and, and scientists in China have also developed the purple rice, which is also enriched in, in similar antioxidants. So if we look at the map of where vitamin A deficiency is, is most obvious, and that can be seen here in the red and the orange colors, as you can see, it's mostly in, in Asia and Africa and Southeast Asia. 
And this is the map of where countries have actually approved the use of GM rice. Now, Australia and New Zealand, Canada and the, and the US have actually all approved it as a, as a product that can be used to treat vitamin A deficiency. Unfortunately, the only two, well, fortunately or unfortunately as it may be in terms of that particular um, uh, condition, the only countries that have accepted it so far are the Philippines and Bangladesh. Um, so that's 2021. This has been a problem for a number of years. This has been stuck in a regulatory loop for probably about the last 10 to 15 years. So it's on the pathway towards acceptance. Philippines only accepted it last year for production. Um, whether it actually becomes the saviour for vitamin A deficiency, we're we yet to see. So I'm just going to skip. I've talked about fortification. I'm going to go back to South Australia in terms of our food crops and, and not just probably South Australia, also Australia, but drought is one of our major issues that we face. Um, particularly the East Coast over the past few years has been decimated by drought. Now there's a lot of interest in this particular wheat. This is a drought tolerant wheat, it's a GMO and it's a bread wheat. So it's something that we would use to produce flour. How has it been developed? It's been developed in Argentina through the addition of a sunflower gene to wheat. And what the scientists showed is that if you put this GM wheat in field trials across, field trials across Argentina, you find that in the uh, under drought conditions, particularly under drought conditions, you can see an increase in wheat yield by up to 20%. Um, now this is a, a bit of a game changer in terms of how it performs. This is what a non-GMO wheat looks like under drought. This is the GMO wheat, so it's looking almost normal. This has the potential to, I guess, save those crops that are getting some water but not enough. It's probably not going to save them if you don't get any rainfall. But there's a lot of interest from Australia. This is the type of wheat that's currently under consideration by Fasans to assess whether the product is actually any different to our normal wheat, whether we have to worry about anything in terms of uh, human trials, in terms of ingesting it and eating it. It'll be very interesting to see what happens over the next probably six months in terms of whether that is a, a, a product that gets approved in terms of a food product for, for human consumption. So I've, I've talked about all these examples and you know, I think probably as a student I would have looked at them and gone, fantastic, this is my career and over time my view has changed and I realised that that's probably not exactly what my career was going to be. It's more about understanding how we can use it in a constructive way and then move forward with, with new technologies and new knowledge. And this is exemplified by the uptake of GM in Australia. And this, this map here is showing conventional field trials. It's from the National Variety Trial website, um, which is run by the Grains, Development, uh, Grains Research Development Corporation. There are hundreds, if not thousands of sites which are trialling new varieties which have been produced via con conventional breeding. Yet, when we look at the number of sites which are looking at GMOs and, and perhaps how useful they are in our environment, there's, there's a handful. And you know, it's, it's very hard to say how good a GMO is in terms of competing with conventional breeding if you don't trial it in the right place and for the right number of years. And that's an expensive process to do those trials. And that's part of the reason why GM has been so limited in Australia. There's a massive cost to deregulate a GM crop so that it can enter our, our production and food chain. And recent estimates from, from Crop Life I was reading yesterday, it's a cost about 136 million US to bring one single event, one single GM event into the, uh, into the system. So that's, that's a lot of money and certainly universities don't have that money. So you need to have a partner in industry who's willing to, to cover that cost. Um, there are other issues, of course, in terms of public perception. What do we really think about GM and, and should we be eating it? Is it ethically the right thing? The industry is wary. Sure, we can produce GM and it may solve our problem. We can produce it in drought years, but is there going to be an export market? Is there going to be a country that wants to accept our GM wheat, which is going to contribute to our $7 billion, um, our $60 billion export market? And of course, that preference of the export market is really important in making our decision. So is there an alternative? And I'm getting to the punchline now, and this is, this is probably um, where things have been going for a number of years. There possibly is an alternative. And this is called CRISPR-Cas9 or gene editing. It's, it's not new in terms of the concept of how we might edit genes um, more, much, with much more precision than what we've done with GM has been around for a number of years. But probably over the last five years, the real um, game changer was made in terms of giving it precision. So giving it a target that we can actually edit in the DNA that was, was focused, it was precise, and it was um, much more 
usable for a scientist and for perhaps even a breeder. So this is an example of the front cover of Nature with this dramatic sort of uh, enzyme here which is breaking the DNA and that's effectively how it works. What the technology does is it tells the plant that's got a mistake. It needs to edit that mistake. It needs to try and fix up um, a problem in a gene. And the way we tell it to go to the right gene is to use a little bit of um, DNA sequence, which we call, it's actually an RNA sequence, which is derived from DNA. It finds its way to the right sequence in the DNA. It clips it and the plant goes, oh, hang on a minute, it's clipped. I have to try and fix this. When it fixes it, sometimes it makes a mistake. And that normally happens during plant evolution. And that's exactly why we see diversity in DNA sequence between different plants. So it's, it's making use of, a, I guess, a natural part of the plant itself. And the, the game changer as far as Australia was concerned that in 2019, um, some pretty significant news was, was released after a long consultation period with diverse groups across the whole spectrum of society. Gene editing in, in one particular form is not considered GM. Now the reason that was, that came about was that there's no way of telling the difference between natural mutations that I can go and find in a plant out there and a mutation which has been created by gene editing. It's the same reason that, you know, probably between me and one of you, there's about 20 million differences in our DNA sequence. The human genome has about 3.2 billion base pairs. There's 20 million differences between us. So there's no way of actually telling in this particular case whether a tomato which has been grown, which has got natural mutations appearing all the time, perhaps 1.5 million compared to its, uh, another tomato species, is actually going to be edited in the lab or is going to be just naturally edited. So it's a pretty important definition. So we've used this and, and really uh, Kalia mentioned I was going to mention my research. Unfortunately this is about the only thing that I'm going to talk about my actual research in the lab. So what have we used gene editing for? And this is one example. And this is to edit barley. Um, and in this particular case, we've been editing a component of the barley grain. It's actually a very healthy component, which we eat in our human diets called beta-glucan. Very good at, um, at defending against colorectal cancer and type 2 diabetes. Now, the, the problem, problem with, with that, that particular component, component is when you, you use barley, barley in the malting uh, process to, to produce beer, beer, it tends to clog up some of the filters. So the, the ideal barley that we use in our, in our malting is going to have low levels of beta-glucan. And this is what barley grain looks like. This is a really thin section of barley grain. What we've done is we've labelled it to show where the beta-glucan normally is. And hopefully you can see on the screen there's sort of green all throughout. So that's telling us there's a lot of beta-glucan in this barley grain. What we did is we, we used gene editing to target the gene which is normally required to produce beta-glucan, knocked out its function. And I think you can see that there's not very much labelling left, if any. So this has completely removed the beta-glucan from that particular barley grain. It's edited one single gene. Hasn't led to any other changes in the DNA as far as we can tell through, through sequencing and has led to a product very quickly in an elite variety of barley that doesn't need any breeding or domestication or very much of it uh, moving forward. And I think that a lovely example of how this can work has been, was shown in, in uh, tomato. And I gave that example before of tomatoes, what they looked like sort of as wild tomatoes before they became domesticated and what they look like now. And this was a study that was published in a, quite a prestigious journal called Nature Biotechnology. What they did is they found four genes that they knew had a pretty important role in domestication. And they, they used gene editing to edit those four genes. And what they did is they effectively converted the wild tomato via gene editing almost into what a domesticated tomato would look like by four changes. Now I did mention just a couple of minutes ago that the wild tomato compared to that domesticated tomato contains around about 1.5 million differences in the DNA sequence. This one contains four differences. So there's a very, very significant difference in the type of changes and the number of changes we're generating. If we think how about how we would do this with breeding to get from this point here to here, we would need to make crosses, we would need to back cross and keep back crossing, but we would still have thousands if not hundreds of thousands of differences in the DNA which are coming in from this wild um, uh, variety to our domesticated variety. So this is kind of an example of what it can really do. A lot of precision, very minimal changes and then a product which is um, is ideally suited to, to what our market might be. Okay, so gene editing shows a lot of promise. Um, 
there's a number of techniques which we have in our toolkit, and I think I, I gave the example of genetic modification and gene editing through a number of cases, but you know, we can still use conventional breeding as well. Uh, so the conventional breeding that we would traditionally use is taking that uh, wild variety or not so good performing variety, might have some good traits such as tolerance to disease, process it into a elite variety and through a process of selection we eventually get to that point of having a disease tolerant and a sweet tomato. Genetic modification, well what we can do is we can take that sweet and susceptible, a disease susceptible tomato, we can introduce a gene that controls tolerance directly so we've got a, a new gene which has been added now to give us the same outcome. Gene editing allows us to edit the gene that might actually be required to perceive that disease so it tricks the plant says I'm not going to have that disease anymore and we can get to the same point. So pretty much they can all end up at the same place. The time is different. The cost is different. I've already said in terms of genetic modification, this is going to cost us at least 136 million. This one, well, it's still going to take some time to develop it. It's certainly not going to cost 136 million. I can generate a gene edited barley plant and have it ready with no GM event probably within about three or four years. So it's certainly different to the process of, of GM. And then conventional breeding, well, that's taking a lot of time and effort as well. Probably takes somewhere between seven to 12 years to get a, a conventional variety into the market. So we need to think about this in terms of access to diversity. We need to bring in new features into our crops. We want them to perform better. We want them to have um, attractive traits such that they can be high value. Uh, and we want to get them to market faster. We need to be competitive against other countries who are, who are very much doing the same things. We've got a great history in agriculture and agricultural research in Australia and we need to make sure we, we're using that. So one way that we're doing this is through um, a, a newly funded research hub and this is an, an Australian government funded research hub, the Australia, uh, Australian Research Council Training Centre for Future Crop Development. This was recently awarded, uh, it's a partnership between the University of Adelaide and Australian National University. It includes a number of researchers. The, the director in Adelaide is Stuart Roy. He's also based at the Wake campus. And this is a centre which is actually going to offer 20 new PhD scholarships to students who are interested in gene editing uh, and GM. But not just in terms of coming to the lab and making your next GM product or your gene edited product. It's about how we have to trial it in the field, how we efficiently do that, how we do that in a socially responsible way, and how we address challenges that society thinks are important. And so there's certainly not only plant scientists involved in this, there's people such as Rachel and Kenny and Carolyn Pluver who are much more um, involved in the social aspects of what GM and gene editing might be. The other part of this is to develop new undergraduate courses which can provide micro-credentials in terms of how we actually manage um, gene editing and, and, and GM crops in the future. So I'm getting the sign that it's time to wrap up and I'm, I'm really close. I just wanted to mention one thing and I think probably um, this is what uh, my kids are most interested in but they're also most sceptical about. So I show them this wonderful picture of Mars here and they say, well Dad, but you know, you're talking about Mars. What's this got to do with this GM and gene editing that you've been blabbing on about for 40 minutes? Okay, so, so Mars is interesting. It's certainly not, um, uh, the, 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 the training centre that we're developing is probably not going to be delivering um, anything to Mars, it's much further away. Somewhere between 56 million and I think as of today Mars is 400 million kilometres from Earth depending on the time of the year so that's pretty important. Um, but we're trying to get people to Mars and I think many of you have probably seen the movie The Martian and, and of course Matt Damon, the fantastic Matt Damon was up there growing potatoes in Mars and in principle it is possible. So what NASA tells us is that the composition of the soil profile on Mars is enough that we could actually grow plants. Challenge is we have to get there first. It's going to take us at least a year, or well, not me, certainly not me. I'm not going to put my hand up, but my kids would kill me. But there's going to be people out there that want to go to Mars. And, and this has become a real focus. Um, whether it's right or not, I, I'm really curious to see what people think. But it's something that we think by 2039 we're going to be going to Mars. Now. If we go to Mars, we need to be able to have the food on, on the space station. We have to be able to make it. We can't take it all from Earth. It's certainly not enough in terms of the amount of weight that's required in, or, in order to make this um, space shuttle fly and get there. So, and the problem is, you know, we could get plants up there, but most plants are not really designed for space travel. 
And this is a photograph of one of the NASA astronauts up on the International Space Station, Serena Rubens, and she's looking at a radish crop in this tiny little contained environment, which is actually producing some radish that they're going to do some experiments on. So how do we actually use plants? Can we use plants as a way to help us get there? Plants are pretty good. I've already talked to you about the fact that they're factories. They can produce new things. We can, we can I guess, trick them into having different heights and different sizes. We can get them to flower when we want, we can stop them from flowering when we want, and we can use gene, edit gene editing and GM for a lot of that. And that's stable. That's the one thing that's going to be stable in space to a point is that we're going to have this, this capacity to grow plants. So can we adapt plants using this, these techniques? Can we use them to produce more than food? We're going to need medicines on this trip. We're going to use plastics. Potentially, we're going to need building materials when we get to Mars. And we also need psychological benefits. So it's all very good to say we're going to go for a year and we're going to fly away. But you know, a lot of the benefits that we see in terms of humans having plants comes from that sensory, OK, I've got this beautiful posy of plants in front of me. This is a photograph of some zinnias that were from the space station. So perhaps this is something that we need to consider. And that innovation is not only going to be something that helps us get to Mars, but the innovation to be able to control plant shape and form and production is something that will come back to Earth not just in broad acre crops such as wheat and barley, but also in terms of contained environments where we might be needing to grow plants more efficiently and more effective in these contained environments. So I'll finish there just with a brief summary. What are our food crops of the future going to look like? So they need to be produced in a sustainable and ethical way. Now gene editing and GM are something that are heavily regulated. Certainly there's a component of, of ethics in terms of my choices as a researcher in this field to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Um, but it's something that really needs to be considered and that's where the training centre will be helpful. Um, plants that we produce, they need to be nutrient enriched. It's clear that we need to get more value out of our plants. We're not going to be able to achieve these uh, 100 billion targets just by producing more. We need to produce better and it needs to be tastier if we're going to eat it. It needs to be able to do good things to our gut and health. They need to fit into a production system, whether that's going to be a broad acre crop or whether that's going to be a contained environment on a space station. And plants are very flexible. We can do lots of things with them um, and efficiently change them. And finally, they need to be suited to diverse environments. So that does get back to that production system. It needs to be able to deal with drought, it needs to be able to deal with frost, but it also needs to be able to give us really good yields under those optimal years. And some examples of what this might look like. Now, I think some of you have probably walked through Rye Mill Park and seen this funny little plant called duckweed. It's an amazing system. It's effectively uh, can be tricked into to making whatever we want, plastics, pharmaceuticals, uh, and it can be all used. It can be recycled, there's a very minimal footprint, so that's something that might be of considerable interest. Also plants that have reduced stature, things like um, these tomatoes here, red robin tomatoes, or the microvine that was developed by Sara, and also high value crops. And this is an example of saffron, particularly high value, certainly much more value in its production in a smaller space than what we get out of some of our traditional crops. And then in terms of what we have now, tomatoes um, are a classic example I've talked about many times. This is an example that was produced by the John Innes Centre in, in the UK, a really antioxidant enriched tomato that's um, proposed to have significant health benefits um, for human consumption. So I'll finish up there. I, I apologise for going a little bit over time. I thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Is that on? Yes, it is. There we go. Thank you very much, Matthew. It's a fantastic presentation. And don't worry, we still have a solid 10 minutes for questions. So oh, we're all good. <laughs> all right. So we do have a few questions that were pre-submitted um, with, the, with the registration. And then we'll give you a chance to answer questions in the room. Um, the first one, for context, this person has said that they research how to make sustainable food choices easier for consumers in supermarkets. So the question is, would you say that GMO food products can be cheaper, tastier and healthier than similar alternatives? I know you have spoken about this a little bit. So mm. firstly, what do you think about that? But then also maybe um, how do you think we can better communicate those qualities to consumers? Certainly, there's some evidence uh, that GM production, so production of GM crops can be cheaper. And that was actually the first example, that flavour saver tomato. Uh, the, the production costs of that were about 20% less than what you would have for a conventional tomato. So that kind of addresses that. You can actually get a reduction in cost. Um, in terms of management in, in our food crops, 
even though herbicide tolerance is controversial, if you think about it in terms of the production system, the idea is it actually does limit your use of herbicide, which you're normally paying for on an annual basis, so yes. In terms of whether it's, it's healthier, I think that was the question, um, it really depends on what that, that food product, that GM food product is designed for. So that, that last example I gave of this indigo tomato here, so that was developed to have higher levels of antioxidants, it's developed to have um, a, a number of traits which are supposed to protect us against cancer, that was the idea. Um, and the, at least the feeding trials that they've done so far show that there's a lot of promise in terms of that. The, the same goes for the bio, uh, biofortification in terms of the golden rice, there's really clear evidence it does have an impact, you can eat that, you can get the benefits, it can help defend against um, vitamin A deficiency. So, Look, there's, there's going to be a niche market for some of them. Certainly we, we see a need where there's a potentially a humanitarian crisis this it might address, and this is the same for GM papaya, which I didn't talk about today. That's saved industries in Africa where they were not able to grow that plant anymore and consume it because it was being decimated by disease. So yes, um, there is a, a potential to get higher uh, health benefits out of it. Um, and that is something, of course, that I mentioned here in terms of what we produce in the future. If there's a need for a nutrient-enriched product um, that we, we, it may not necessarily be the only solution, but it can be part of a solution. Mm, fantastic. And so how do you think we can better communicate those sorts of benefits to consumers, maybe if they're, if for the more general market, if yeah. there is one? Look, that's a, that's a challenge, and it's always the challenge that we've faced as scientists who, who work with this technology every day and, and go through um, years of, of reading literature and trying to understand the pros and the cons of this technology and that's that's fine that's my job but for my mum and dad who see this you know they still go oh so what's what's really the good thing about this and what are you doing you know is it, is it going to be better um, look we have to communicate I think the, the the trouble we've faced over the past two years with with vaccination and COVID is a clear example that it's not easy to get that message across it's just something that we need to keep um, selling and we need to keep talking to people at least so that they're informed and they understand the difference between um, scare tactics or perhaps that the type of um, things that we're seeing on Facebook these days just the perpetuation of, of misinformation compared to the other extreme which is the scientist who's saying look this is fine this is great and it's somewhere in between so we need to be able to get that message out there it needs to come from scientists governments educators um, and industry the, 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 probably the, the good thing about our gene editing GM center that which we're talking about involves 19 different industry partners um, who perhaps haven't historically been in this space so it's an opportunity to educate them as well about what the advantages of the technology are and whether they actually think that there's a market for it and a use for it in their system mm, absolutely thank you Another question that was pre-submitted, um, I think this is quite an interesting one, they phrased it as, why do we think we can improve on nature? Yes, okay, so what's nature? That's, that's <laughs> a really good one. Um, okay, so in terms of our, our, most of our food crops, it's, it's actually, I mean, they're so different from their natural progenitor these days, uh, and I think the corn example is a classic one, that you, you wouldn't recognise what it looked like. It's even the same for me, I go back, and look at some of the old barleys and I think, is that really barley? It just looks like a grass that I would try and get rid of out of my lawn. Uh, so, you know, there's been a process of selection for many, many years by humans, for thousands of years in, in some cases, particularly in the case of corn and, and wheat, whereby we've chosen what, what we think are the, the traits that we need. And, you know, the problem there, I think, is a lot of them have been focused only on yield. Um, there is an element of quality and nutrition, but that's probably what we've missed along the way. You know, probably there are some really fantastic things in these wild varieties that we've never really made use of that have been selected against. So there's, there's two ways that we can do this. We can kind of um, go back to nature and say, right, let's start again. Let's re-domesticate barley or wheat or corn. And I don't think any of us want to hang around for 2,000 years to do that. Um, or, you know, we can use gene editing. That's an example. Identify what we think are the key genes that might have been changed over time or lost over time, can we domesticate sort of one of the, the previous, the progenitors of, of maize, of corn, uh, or can we bring back some of that diversity using gene editing and put it into modern day corn and see if that actually does what we, we expect or we hope. It doesn't mean it will, we still need to test it, we still need to trial it, we need to make sure it's the right thing and that's where the, I guess, the ethical component comes in. 
uh, in terms of making sure that you know, we, we're not just doing it because we can, but we're doing it because there's a reason for it. Absolutely. All right, maybe, maybe one more pre-submitted question and then we can take a couple from the audience. Uh, we do still have a couple of minutes. Um, one more uh, of these questions is, can you tell us a little bit about what it does to the human body when we eat GM food? I know you mentioned earlier this might not be specifically your area of expertise, but can you comment on that at all? S certainly not my area of expertise. <laughs> um, I've read a number of studies about uh, which have compared um, uh, products which have been made from a GM crop compared to a conventional crop and uh, look there's there's different schools of thought the majority of them suggest that there's there's minimal changes of course it depends on what you've done if you've chosen a crop which you've engineered to have really high antioxidant levels you actually hope it's going to do something to the human gut maybe change the microbiome and the bacteria in a good way so what you can stimulate the pathways that you want Certainly not my area of expertise. It's a really yeah. fantastic area that I'd, I'd like to know more about myself, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave that one. Sure, thank you. All right, we do now have some time for questions from the audience. We've got a couple uh, down the front, or one at the, one at the back, yes, thank you. A particular note, um, particularly from the farmer's perspective, um, a few years ago there was an issue with a, with a farmer using, I believe it was wheat crops uh, from Monsanto. When he signed over his, um, when he signed to use the Monsanto crop, there was an understanding that he would be constantly buying um, his and not using his wheat for reseeding. Now, that particular farmer was reseeding because it was cheaper. And obviously, in an environment like farming, margins are tight. You're trying to look to make profit as it is. Markets are fluctuating all the time. Has this been identified as an issue with crops um, which are being uh, prepared with industry partners? And are there any protections in place for farmers which might make them more willing to, say, go with a GM crop or a CRISPR crop um, and also prevent them from being exploited by industry? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I think, you know, we, it's not only an example in wheat. There's been a couple of cases where it was shown in the state. A lot of that was in the early days whereby uh, they were taking corn, they were trying, well, Corn's not a great example. Soybean was the example. They were trying to reseed it themselves and then get the benefits out of it. And there were pretty strict contractual agreements from those companies that were providing that seed. And, and that was their mechanism to actually ensure they made money out of it. Now, that's whether that's the right thing or not. What we're seeing in terms of GM these days, there's certainly um, a very convoluted regulatory landscape to go through in terms of, let's say, gene editing, for example, is even less clear. But GM, there, there are certainly contracts in terms of them. But the seed that gets produced by these companies, you often can't get the benefit in subsequent generations. It's, it's just the way of, of, of breeding and reproduction. The first generation is going to be fine. You're going to get your yield. But it, it's just the way that they create them that you actually, and that this is natural, it's about hybrids, particularly in terms of canola and corn, um, that you don't get the benefits. So it's in your best interest to get the yield to go back to the company. In terms of wheat, um, look, it's, it's hard to answer. There's certainly trials of wheat going on. Um, in terms of the companies that own the IP, there, there's certainly some companies in Argentina which have been um, have, have owned the rights for the, the HB4 wheat. Um, there's groups in Australia that are trying to bring that in and see whether it actually performs better in our system. There needs to be protection for farmers. And it depends on whether it's a, a humanitarian question as well or whether it's something which has actually been developed by a, a company. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds a lot of this GM work. And they have really strict requirements that if you're going to develop a soybean or a um, um, a, a black-eyed pea which is actually going to be used for cultivation in, in these countries, you cannot have an IP arrangement which stops them from collecting and sowing again. When you get to countries like Australia, the US, it's a little bit less clear how it's going to operate. Um, the companies have to make their money some way, it's clear, I think we all would agree on that, but you know, we need to make sure that the farmers are actually getting the benefit as well in terms of ensuring their, their margin is there so that they are going to grow it in the first place. Thanks, we do have another couple in the middle. I think we have time for maybe two more questions, if that's all right. Hi, um, what do you think the main fear of GM crops is? And do you think gene editing is going to overcome that fear or is it just a matter of pedantics? 
Ah, oh, yes. If, if I knew the answer to what the real fear was, I mean, there's been a lot of surveys which have been done, and, and one particularly good one, I think it was done by, I think it's ANU or University of Sydney, and I apologise for, for not quite getting that right, that's, that's looked at public perception and, and thinking about GM over a period of time. And, and what's happened is actually GM approval ratings have effectively gone up. And you can look at the survey in any way you like, uh, but that's the major outcome. So it's, we've, we've become used to it, 30 years of growing them in terms of canola, in terms of cotton, has made us realise, okay, there's not gonna be some massive change which is gonna be a huge problem to our production system, to our environment, um, at least in terms of Australia, and that's looking at Australians. In the US, there's been some differences. They have con kind of gone down that monoculture approach, which, which does create this concern about who owns it. And I think that that is the main thing over the years is this constant concern about big biotech companies owning the rights and they're the ones that are, I have to buy it from and I don't have any choice and, and they're going to flood the market with this particular product and I'm going to have to eat GM. I don't think that's going to be the case and personally that's not going to be the choice for me. You know, it, it may be that I identify a product that I want to buy which is GM. And, and that's what I buy, that's all, that's all good. But I mean, I'm educated in terms of understanding what the difference is. If you take it back to the basic level, it's a difference in the DNA. Most of that DNA is gonna be processed in our guts. So the, the health argument is, is not, not great. Um, so I think, yeah, to answer your question, fear comes from that, that big biotech industry um, component. And we've, we've seen that's changed over a number of years. The big Monsanto is, is not quite what it was. Um, they're still, well, the, the, the eventual product of that is a company called Corteva and, and Pioneer is, is part of that. They, they are certainly involved in a lot of humanitarian missions to develop GM crops for third world countries. But yeah, I think that's still something we have to get over is that fear that it's, it's all big biotech. We have one more question from the gentleman in there. Uh, this, is, this is kind of related to that last question. It's, it's comforting to know that there's pretty strict regulation involved in getting approval for this stuff. Are there any examples where approval hasn't been given? And what were the reasons? Was it because of the commercial aspects or the health aspects or some other unknown? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, good question. So in order, uh, in order to do work on GM, you know, the university has a system in place which is, is uh, specified by the government. We have to have this IBC. And so the Institutional Biosafety Committee effectively assesses every application to work on GM. Uh, within our university, and that's the same for anyone who uses gene technology in Australia. So we will, you know, identify the risk. That's our job, and we will say there is a high risk, so we need to manage that in a way. It doesn't normally stop us from doing that work if we see that there's a way to, to limit that risk. Now, once that goes through to what we call a, a, a DIR, is a direct intentional release, that's for a field trial of GM plants. The, you know, that becomes a lot stricter again. So there's another level of risk there that we must address and the researchers must know that. If we really think we've got a product that's gonna to go to market, there's no way that we'll get to that market without having a, a partner in industry. So they all have to come in and say, yep, we're gonna help you trial that in a number of places. And then we'll be going to Fasans at some point to say, that's, that's the Food Standards Australia, New Zealand, to say, here's the product, you need to check it and make sure it's okay or at least give us the opportunity to check it and see if it's okay. Um, a lot of this information is available on the websites uh, of OGTR and, and for SANS, it's, it's required that they provide that information. I'm not aware, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows of anything really being knocked back um, through some health or safety risk. Um, but then again, the cost to get there, you've got to have a pretty good idea that this is going to be a useful product and it's going to make a difference if you're going to invest 100 and $40 million in it in the first place. So yeah, I, I, I don't think I can, I can't think of an example where that's been the case. All right, thank you very much. And I think we'll leave it there for questions. My apologies if anyone had a burning one. Um, but I would like to finish now by thanking tonight's speaker, Matthew, you've delivered a, a fantastic, very engaging presentation. And an enormous thank you to you, our audience, uh, as always for your fantastic questions uh, and comments and for coming along tonight. Uh, we very much look forward to inviting you back for November, which is going to be our last Research Tuesdays for the year. It has been another tough year for in-person events, um, but November is sure to, uh, sure to wrap up a highly educational and exciting year of research here at the University of Adelaide. Uh, so be sure to sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already, so you can get the latest information about uh, next month's talk and all other Research Tuesdays news.
Thank you for tuning in once again, and we hope to see you next time. Good night, everyone.